<clears throat> Hello and welcome to the Quagmire, um, the podcast of the MMU Philsop. Today, um, this is in fact the second podcast we've had with a registered professor. So introduce yourself, Paul. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. I'm Dr. Paul Gilardi. I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy here at ManMet, and I'm the BA program philosophy leader. So it's really, really wonderful for me to be here and have the opportunity to chat and, and learn from, from all the Q&As. And yeah, really looking forward to it. We can't wait as well. So, Laura, I think you have quite a few questions for the man himself. So far away. I do, I do. Okay, good. So yeah, thank you for being with us, Paul. And so we were just um, kind of touching upon uh, your book that you have edited and also wrote the chapter and a chapter and the introduction of. Would you like to kind of give us an idea of what that book um, is about? And uh, yeah, I kind of, obviously it's very, very complicated to give a summary, but just, you know, a rundown. No, no problem at all. So the book that's coming out um, in bookstores Amazon, etc. cetera, uh, 23rd of December. So if you're thinking about getting a, a fancy Christmas present, get that book for a loved one. Or if you're trying to, you know, go on a date, use that book as a pickup line. Um, I did not say that. That's just off the cuff. Um, the, <laughs> book, the book's title is Hegel and the Frankfurt School. And it's an edited uh, collection comprising 10 thematic chapters concerning this really wonderful relationship between a tradition that's started in the 1930s in Frankfurt as uh, a Western Marxist university research institution. And it's grown and grown and grown and it's become one of the most important current trends in contemporary social and political theory. Cuts across interdisciplinary divides, philosophy, sociology, psychoanalysis. And it's all about the collection trying to make sense of that dialogue between the Frankfurt School and Hegel, because Hegel is in many respects mm -hmm. that watershed figure in the history of thought. Some sociologists credit him as really the first systematic sociologist in the way. He is both a source of skirt for the Frankfurt School theorists, particularly Theodore Adorno, who reacts to Hegel and thinks Hegel is the problem that we have to overcome to articulate a vision of progress, a vision of emancipation. But also Hegel is seen as precisely the key to emancipation, the key to progress. So he's got this wonderfully vexing relationship across the generation, from the first generation of thinkers like Max Horkheimer and Adorno, then the second generation of figures like Jürgen Habermas, who's still alive, still publishing, at 94, wow. a machine, wow. credible man. And then the current leader of the third generation, Axel Honneth, who has just finished his directorship at Frankfurt and at Columbia. So it's, this is very much here and now. It's a very contemporary yeah. relevant subject. And the book tries to do justice. It tries to take stock of the relationship. You know, what is the relationship centering on? What themes are discussed particularly by these philosophers in dialogue with Hegel? What are the areas of convergence, contestation, and what what do they what do their voices mean for now? What do they mean for the contemporary crisis in the Anthropocene? Whether it's about contemporary crisis of capitalism, issues about gender, issues about race, sexuality, trans identity. What, what can they contribute to this discourse? And I think all, all 10 chapters talk about specifically the ways in which Hegel's thought in conjunction with the thought of the Frankfurt School theorists across the generation contributes to improving discourse and contributing to progressive social change. So that's the motivation of the book. Yeah, and um, your, your chapter is called The Dragon Seed Project. Is that, is that yes. right? Do you want yeah. to sort of, yeah, give an explanation of that title? So the Dragon Seed Project, I, I was coming up, I, was trying to, I wanted to come up with something quite grabby. You know, almost makes you think like it's like a title of an RPG game, like something from Skyrim or something. Um, Hegel is this action figure. And the, 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 the expression Dragon Seed comes from actually the King of Prussia himself. 
So Hegelianism was deemed this dragon seed, which needed to be stamped out because it was mm-hmm. deemed a threat to the political status quo. Very, very kind of conservative type of government in Prussia in the 1820s. Mm-hmm. You know, the Prussian reform movement at this moment in time, which wanted to come up with a, a liberal constitution, a codified constitution had been nipped in the bud because rising authoritarian crackdowns. And what happened was um, the King of Prussia through his Minister of Education told Hegel's former colleague, they were, they were they used to be BFFs, but then there was a big fallout um, after Hegel published his, his first book in 1806. What happened was, was uh, the King of Prussia via the Minister of Education asked Schelling, Hegel's former BFF, to go and take up the position at Berlin that Hegel had vacated because he had died in 1831 Mm. to stamp out the dragon seed. I think that's why it's just an extraordinary moment in the history of Western philosophy that Hegel dies in 1831, Mm. then Schelling, who's still alive, is summoned to take over his chair in Berlin to purge Berlin of any kind of progressive thought. And it's extraordinary. So, you know, what I wanted to then do was say, yeah, you know, let's see why exactly it is a dragon seed. Why is it that the Prussians at the time feared Hegel's thoughts so much because it articulates visions of emancipation from circumstances of oppression? But equally, why is it that Hegel's thought is viewed precisely in the opposite terms that people associate Hegel with? domination, mm-hmm. with lack of progress, with reactionary thought. And then the subtitle of that is obviously a line from Audre Lorde, you know, can the master's house be dismantled using the master's tools? Mm-hmm. Now, Audre Lorde obviously says, no, you can't get patriarchs suddenly dismantling patriarchy, but maybe Hegel with his very sophisticated notion of imminent social critique way of internally critiquing society by reference to its own norms. Maybe that can do the job. Maybe that's also why it's a dragon seed, because it reveals how society can change by referencing its own internal developmental logics. Right. And what kind of society does Hegel want? Like, what, what, would his, what would the Hegelian utopia be? That's a wonderful question. I suppose the difficulty with that is that like you have Kramer versus Kramer, you've got Hegel versus his own resources. Now that sounds weird, so what do I mean? Hegel himself was actually quite a conservative person. You know, he, he, he isn't especially liberatory when it comes to women himself. You know, reference, he even refers to women almost like in, in neo-Aristotelian ways as plants in the philosophy of, life, of right. And he has astonishingly disparaging views about um, race. So, you know, given that, one might just say in answer to Harry's question, it's just like a religious conservative's norm, you know, nuclear family, heteronormativity, etc. But, here's the but. What is extraordinary about Hegel is precisely how, while he himself has what we could we could call a limited critical disposition in terms of what he envisages the utopia. So a constitutional monarchy, a nuclear family, a fairly regulated capitalist system, that's important because that's subject to a lot of critical discussion, certainly in the chapter. But feminists, post-colonial theorists, and decolonial theorists all queue up behind Hegel to say, actually, there is something about his notions of freedom, his notions of recognition, which can be used for radical political purposes. So Hegel's vision for the family might have been at the time, just enhanced patriarchy and enhanced nuclear family. But his resources, his conceptual resources, point a vision because he's all about changeability, you know, calling out fixed categorizations. He hates fixed categories. Very much, you know, that kind of Heraclitus, things flow, things constantly change. 
welcome change, embrace change, love change. You know, that kind of discourse lends itself awfully compatible in a good way, naturally even compatible with movements like radical feminism, with movements like trans liberation, with movements like decolonialism and post-colonialism. So the, the utopia is precisely not simply the Kantian idea of people just respecting one another. It's about people understanding that difference is not something to overcome, but something to be embraced precisely because difference is what enables moments of genuine connection with others and moments of genuine solidarity at the political level. So I think that's, that's, his, that's the utopianism of the Hegelian conceptual scheme, which is so different to what Hegel himself would have thought. Hey, and now just, I've got a question. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off, but um, do you think, um, with that Hegel's quite conservative reactionary mm. politics, do you think he actually believed that and was just short-sighted in his own theory, or do you think he was trying to, like, you know, <clears throat> advocate for those positions because he thought it necessary to not be, like, blackballed by the philosophical, like, you know, establishment? It's one of the most interesting questions about Hegel the person because he's he's an extremely savvy operator. Very savvy guy. Because at the moment in Germany or Prussia technically at the time, you've got the demagogue crisis, which is any liberal pro progressive academics were being sacked from office because they were being deemed as, you know, council state. This is all part of the, the authoritarian crackdown at the time. Yeah. Yet Hegel is the only one who isn't subject to the demagogue crisis. He is never removed from his post. And his contemporaries like Friedrich Schleiermacher, like, her, um, uh, like Jakob Fries, who he targets explicitly, all start to think, oh, you see, you know why Hegel isn't being targeted? Because he's just the classic Kalto of the Prussian restoration movement. He's just really all about autocracy, authoritarianism, totalitarianism. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The guy is very savvy. And there's this wonderful line, which I quoted at the beginning of my chapter by Heinrich Heine, one of the contemporaries, when, you know, the famous statement when Hegel says that the actual is rational and the rational is actual. And people think, oh, that means, you know, whatever it is, is currently perfect. You know, you glorify the present. And Hegel just, you know, looks at him and just goes, really? You think that's what I mean? You really think that's what I'm getting at by talking about what is actual is rational, that I'm saying the here and now is perfect? You know, so he's, he's mm -hmm. dropping hints, dropping hints, you know, subversively undercutting the Prussian government and its authoritarian tendencies while evading the charge of being a demagogue. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, wonderful exercise in political savviness. Mm -hmm. Because he makes a distinction between what exists and what's actual. Yeah, so that's so exactly, yeah. It is most, most technical distinction in his social and political work is this distinction between existence in German, which just means what is currently happening. And then Wirklichkeit, the idea of actuality. And it's, it's effectively a kind of progressive Aristotelianism. You know, what is, essence, what is actuality? It's the unity of something's essence with its current existence. And it's this idea of constantly trying to improve, constant attempts to actualize, to realize, to perfect and go beyond its present. And it's wonderful because, again, you would think as an Aristotelian, he's committed to fixed essences. You know this, you, you've looked at Greek already. You know how, how fond Aristotle is for fixed categories. But Hegel takes the idea of a category, but then completely historicizes it and talks about how the category can be subject to all sorts of progressive changes. When I read it, I was reminded of like Platonism, like. But now you say that it's it's like Aristotelian, because I thought that he was saying that there was a, like a universal form, and that the actuality of something was how much it corresponded with the form. So, like, what have I misunderstood there? It's like, a very natural 
thing to conf- to think that about Hegel as a Platonist because of you know the idea of form. But the Aristotelian side is that the form is the internal organization of something itself. So when you when you are realizing your form, it's the idea of you are actualizing what's potential in you. Not a universal form that exists somewhere up here. No, that's the central point. So hey, and this is where it, it gets all the weird and wonderful and sexy world of Hegel's logic and his metaphysics, is that Hegel has this uh, very, very fascinating distinction in his in his most obscure work, but which is arguably the heart of the system, the science of logic, where he, he articulates in very, very, very specific technical detail what this exactly means at, at the logical metaphysical level. So universal properties don't exist independently of their particulars. They do in Plato's thought. Rather, universal properties can only exist when they are realized in individuals. And that's the Aristotelian point. There is no world of forms completely independent of particulars. Mm-hmm. Forms are realized within objects because they are the structuring principles of those objects themselves. So to, to use a kind of slogan term, Plato is, a, is called an extreme realist. You know, the forms are out there. And, you, know, you have to escape your body to, to get them. But... Um, Hegel, like Aristotle, is a moderate realist, that the forms are real, they're not fictions of our mind, they're not mental constructions, but they're real insofar as that they are realizable in the things which bear them, the things which bear properties themselves, the subject. So individuals have huge status in Hegel's thought. Why he's so, why he's so interested in recognition. How does that tie in with the idea of like absolute spirit? Because I was under the impression that Hegel was a kind of idealist and that he saw everything as the movement of this spirit. So how how would that tie in with that? So another very easy to misunderstand notion about idealism is the idea that Hegel is thinking about some kind of cosmic self that is somehow achieving self-consciousness by creating the empirical world. I mean, to, set, to call that as a, as a crazy and extravagant view would be putting it, <laughs> putting it mildly. And it's natural to think that way because of how he understands the absolute. But what he means by absolute spirit is nothing metaphysical in that particular sense. What he means by absolute spirit is a particular kind of development of subjectivity that sees things as fundamentally interconnected. So it's a type of worldview, absolute spirit, which is produced only at the level of art, religion, and philosophy. So art, religion, and philosophy are all trying to make sense of the interconnectedness of all things. Art does it through aesthetic representation, what philosophers call mimesis, so the, the activity of representation. Religion does it through sim- symbolism, through symbolic practices like the Eucharist for the Judeo-Christian tradition. And, and, and at the level of anthropology, we talk about the, the, the rituals involved in religious practice. But philosophy does it conceptually. And Hegel thinks that what an idealist does, and he famously says in the Science of Logic, all philosophy is idealism. What he means by that is all philosophy is concerned with understanding how things are fundamentally interconnected. The difference, though, between Hegel and his predecessors is that Hegel thinks they're all wrong. (laughs) So he thinks that he's found a way of articulating the fundamental interconnectedness of things. He's figured out the way in which art, religion and philosophy all serve this cognitive endeavour of seeing the, the fundamental interconnectedness of individuality, universality, freedom, determination, the state and the individual desire and reason. So that's, that's his concern. How to make sense of all of these dualisms in a, in a robust and serious way, not to simply say, yeah, man, it's all connected. We're, we're, you know, he hates Parmenides, remember? He doesn't want to have this view that everything is one and that being is fixed. No, you know, there is difference. Difference is partly connected with universality. And individuality is the product of difference merging with universality. 
and that's what he wants to do as, as an idealist is establish that connection between difference and universality without seeing individuals swallowed by the universal whole. So he's not saying that mind is like the ontological primitive, that's a misunderstanding. That's, yeah, that's Barclay's idealism. That's right. George Barclay's idealism. You know, um, essay es percipi vel percipere, to be is to be a mind or to be an idea perceived by a mind. Hegel's idealism is concerned with the idea of establishing reason as sovereign. You know, how, um, how reality is fundamentally intelligible. So that's an epistemological claim that the world is conducive to rational reflection. And that the world above all contains rational structures, which can be discovered by developing our minds along idealist grounds, by precisely seeing things as interconnected rather than uh, being constricted to conceptual binaries. So we no longer get troubled by say the free will problem. So for Hegel, the free will problem rests on the category error, that you think determination and free will are incompatible. And again, um, can you argue that we create rather than rational categories being like, you know, the origin rational categories are something that we create to try and understand the chaos of the world? Because, I mean, people could argue that chaos is more likely than order. So mm -hmm. let's have I take a book, cut all the pages out, um, then drop the book. It lands in a, in a mess, like, mm -hmm. and that shows that chaos is more likely than order. Surely, can you argue that we're using rather than the rational like, categories being inherent to the world, we just create them to, you know, try and make sense of the world. It's a, that's a really brilliant point because it ties into a, a, an issue in a tradition in metaphysics, which is made explicit in Adrian Moore's wonderful 2012 monograph on the history of metaphysics, the evolution of making sense of things. When Adrian Moore defines metaphysics in this way, Metaphysics is our most general attempt to make sense of things. And the Hegelian perspective, which he discusses, he discusses literally everything. Descartes, Hume, everyone, Carnap in the 20th century, Deleuze as well on the continental side. And the point that Moore says when he thinks about Hegel is that for the Hegelian, the very activity of engaging in inquiry, whether through the categories of chaos and order, presupposes that there is a world which can be made sense of. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we're able to make sense of things is not simply because we are good at sense making, we're not just good at coming up creating concepts, it's that the world is structured in a specific way, which he elaborates in the science of logic, such that our activities of conceptualization, our activities of thinking, coming up with concepts, trying to see how those concepts stand in relation to one another, those activities map onto the intelligible structure of the world itself. So our categories of chaos and order, just to use two, are to be understood for Hegel crucially dialectically, so they're interconnected, one cannot be without the other, because that's the fundamental structure of reality itself. And the, the job of the philosopher is to develop the vocabulary for making sense of that. So does Hegel have like some kind of metaphysic, like for instance, like some might, someone might say idealism, like everything's mind, or someone might say materialism, mm. It's like a physical world like what would Hegel say is the nature of reality? It's interesting because he's both an idealist and a materialist. <laughs> I think his perspective is would be to say that the, the and the tension between those two for him rests on the mistake. Um, much like for example even when he when he died you had there are two camps of thoughts so you have dialectical idealists and dialectical materialists where Marx is seen as the, the, the spearheader of the materialist camp. For Hegel, we understand, at least in my own work um, in, in, and shared with others in the Anglo-American tradition, we understand reality as the fundamental interconnectivity between higher order phenomenon like normative phenomena, so like reasons, 
attitudes, perspectives, etc., and lower order natural phenomena like atoms, quarks, etc. And for Hegel, the most important point when we think about the relationship between mind and world is that we see spirit, Hegel's term for mind, as nothing spooky, but as, a, as an irreducibly emergent property. You know, when you have the world structured, nature is structured in a certain way, that will see the category of rational self-consciousness, what he means by mind, emerge. So it's a really fascinating idea about, you know, his, his metaphysics. So he's, he's effectively, if people believe what I say about Hegel, he's a naturalist, but a, of a liberal or Catholic variety. You know, reality is fundamentally natural. There's nothing inherently spooky about it, but the complexity in nature is something which emerges from its organizational structure. And that, that's the crucial point about Hegel, it's, the, it's that he has this emergentist view about intentionality, about reasons. So it's not that Cartesian dualism of, you know, you have mental substance on one side, and then you've got material substance on the other side. That, so that, that kind of rests on the category error for Hegel. He's kind of a panpsychist. Well, there is now, right now, it's happening. This very moment in time, there are people writing books and articles and edited collections on whether or not Hegel can be reasonably regarded as a panpsychist. You know, that everything is minded. I mean, from my perspective, I think the, the only the issue with that, I mean, we can talk about the textual details, but, you know, it's not fun to do it when you don't have the text in front of you. Um, we can pour over those, like, oh, you know, in the logic, he says this, no, in the, in the philosophy of spirit, he says that. Eh. I think that the more interesting issue is, is that for Hegel, what is, the, what is the defining property of mind is the capacity for freedom. And it's more than simply the Kantian idea of autonomy, you know, rational self-legislation. It's more about the idea of being able to engage in practices of intersubjective recognition. And tables and chairs can't do that for Hegel. Whether or not Hegel thinks, and this is where it's also another wonderful world of new scholarship that's emerging, whether or not Hegel thinks that animals, non-human animals, are capable of being agentive in the sense that they have personhood, they have agency, they have intentionality, they have duties, which must be um, commanded to respect. Personally, I think Hegel would include. Hege Hegel's resources point to viewing the environment itself as agentive. You know, the environment is a kind of person in a way. It can be wronged, it can be harmed, it can be mistreated, it can be abused. Now, whether or not that would satisfy Panpsychists, Harry, I don't know. You know. They might say, no, it has to have, you have to have real kind of mind everywhere, like even in pebbles, <laughs> even, at, even at the really microbiological level. But certainly for Hegel, nature is, it's not simply a feat mind. It's not just, uh, you know, a, a category of being which is devoid of intentionality, far from it. You know, when, when we look at the environmental movement and we talk about our relationship with our environment, it's, it's a deeply Hegelian point that we are in a crisis of recognition when we are violating the integrity of nature. And equally, the whole point about the struggle for recognition, which is the underlying current of all of Hegel's social and political theory, you know, we can also apply that to thinking about the environmental movement, the struggle to recognize the harm being done to our planet by our own behavior. So that's again, you know, an expansion of the Hegelian discursive frame to areas that he wouldn't even have thought about. So he's saying something like, uh, he's saying something like the, the comple like complex human life grows out of the environment like a flower yeah. on a bush, rather than like that view, that old fashioned view where like human beings are seen somehow as like aliens, like, like God implants the soul in the body and it's like humans are like strangers in their own world kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah grow out kind of thing that's a that's a very very beautiful and helpful way of thinking about it. exactly and he also thinks about human beings 
particularly at least as he calls them amphibians, which is really weird in the sense that, you know, what is amphibious about human beings is that we're able to step seamlessly between two different conceptual spaces. That space of nature, where we think purely in, in dry, scientific, rational, mathematical terms. But then also we're able to engage in all this weird and wonderful intentional thought. And the language of first person psychology, the language of aesthetics, the language of art, the language of creativity, the language of hope, religious you know, discourse, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's, that's Hegel's point, is that you, you, we're amphibian in the sense that also you can't reduce one to the other, because that will forsake you being amphibious. You just have to deal with complexity. You know, so if, if, for example, you have people of a particular political ideology, ideological persuasion who are saying, oh, God, no, I have to use all of these different pronouns. You know, I have to constantly, you know, be aware of, you know, what non-binary gender is and what, you know, queer non-binary gender is, etc. Hegel would just say, deal with it. Life is complex. Embrace the complexity. And I think that's why increasingly, you know, Philosophers like Judith Butler, author of Gender Trouble and other beautiful works, you know, Butler is increasingly talking about Hegel's influence on her own work, her own you know, unique type of feminism, which is influenced by Foucault and by Nietzsche. So there is something to this idea about, you know, the, the point that you talk about, the, the flower analogy is, is very, very well motivated because it precisely talks about the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And that's also designed to show us that because we emerge from nature, we can't see ourselves reasonably as separate from nature. We can't thereby also lay the theoretical ground for any kind of anthropocentrism or, you know, America first ideology or human first ideology, you know, we are fundamentally part of a complex living system. We're not special in that sense, but what's special is our ability to be self-consciously attentive to that position. Like when an astronaut goes into space, he has to take the planet with him, so to speak, like he has to take with him the soil and the air and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And it's precisely because the astronaut does that that when they look at the, at the world from that extra perspective, they have a particularly emotional reaction to it. Because, you know, even though the world is there and it's, you know, in, in microphysical terms, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers away, it is present insofar as since you are a natural agent, you are bound up with your environment. I'll say that you are responsive to your environment as well. I'm sorry for um, cutting you off there, like, but um, I was about to say that, um, you know, the world as this, like, constantly growing like flower and stuff, like, can you argue that that could be used mm. to refute the idea of conservatism? That shows that conservatism is inevitably at odds with how the universe works. It's a, it's a really interesting line of thought, that, because... Even if you don't know the details of the, the, the logic and metaphysics attached to the concept of actuality, Hegel's thought in general is all about embracing change mm -hmm. because he understands agency as historically situated. That's the most, that's the, like Hegel 101. Like what's the first thing you learn about Hegel? It's that the historical and social conditions affecting agency. And it's as soon as you buy that claim, as soon as you buy that claim, agency, subjectivity, identity is historically associated, situated, bam, the conservative is out of the picture. They're out of the picture. Yeah. They're out of the picture for a very simple reason. Conservatives, conservatism is the idea that things are fixed. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to maintain the fixed nature of these categories. But Hegel is, by virtue of his own categories, explicitly anti-conservative. Now, some people think he's liberal. I viciously disagree. <laughs> I think that the liberal reading of Hegel is awful, frankly. Um, I spent 50 pages ranting about the liberal mm -hmm. reading in the book. <laughs> um, whether or not Hegel is socialist is, a, is, a, is another issue. 
or you know whether he has a, a completely different conception of democracy, one which isn't rooted in representational practices of voting and electoral colleges, ac vote acquisitions. Maybe there's something completely different about Hegel on, on the political spectrum. Maybe even he's proto-anarchist. Who knows? I mean, the, I don't think that's true because he's wedded to the state, whereas anarchists mm -hmm. reject the legitimacy of the state in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting is that as soon as we, as soon as we just, you know, from the outset, dismiss the idea of Hegelian resources or Hegelian methods as supportive of conservatism, where we just say, actually, dude, no, like <laughs> Hegel is the anti-conservative when we look at his methods. The really productive philosophical question then becomes, well, what, where does Hegel stand? Now, we got the conservative out of the way, great. But that's just one claim. We want to see what we can build in terms of our alternative models to conservatism. So I think that's a, it's, a, it's a brilliantly well taken point. And as soon as we get to that stage where we realize, okay, um, you know, Hegel basically has a kind of logical metaphysical argument against conservatism, let alone this wonderful, rich ethical narrative about how we are always moving towards progress. We're always trying to in envision conditions of emancipation and freedom then we will have far more productive discussions, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Laura is like itching to ask some, like some questions. No, no, no. It was like I was, I was enjoying listening to that. It's just actually you covered a few questions with it, with, sort of within that. But I kind of wanted to get back to the uh, sort of the critical theory element yes. of um, the Horkheimer, um, the Frankfurt School, and um, I. You know, recently there was a, something in the, I think it was a Guardian article about the government wanting to ban a uh, critical, is it, is it like just race theory or is it critical theory in general? Specifically that was, yeah, critical race theory. Right. If you want, I'm more than happy to, to go through the taxonomy um, here. Because oh, I, I was just thinking if you could maybe sort of um, explain sort of critical theory and then more specifically critical race theory. Sure. Um, in education or, yeah. Fab. So the term critical theory has a broad meaning and then a very narrow technical meaning. Usually you can tell when it's capitalized. So capital C, capital C has, is the narrow focus. Lowercase c, lowercase, lowercase t is the general focus. Okay. The capitalized version, the narrow version is the, the very specific notion of what the Frankfurt School neo-Marxists were interested in. So a critical theory is interested, in so, is interested in so far as that unlike traditional theory, this is the target, traditional theory is con content with describing the world. That's what a theory does. You provide a best explanation, best description. But the critical theorist is individuated to the extent that the critical theorist is not interested in simply describing the world, nor even in explaining the world, but in questioning whether or not the whole vocabulary, the whole conceptual scheme, Laura, you phrased it right at the beginning, lens, the whole lens framework mm -hmm. is fit for purpose. And the central theme from critical theory in the broad sense of the term, which whether it's the Frankfurt School, feminism, anti-racist struggles, post-colonialism, queer theory, that's another type of critical theory. All critical theorists are united by one simple claim, that current social reality is normatively deficient. In other words, current social reality is fundamentally wrong. Specifically, its wrongness consists that the circumstances that we find ourselves in are circumstances of oppression. And the task of the critical theorist is to articulate firstly a diagnosis of oppression. Now, what exactly is responsible for oppression? And critical theorists have completely different answers, some of which are really incompatible with, with others. And then secondly, is once you've done the diagnosis task, you almost have a kind of therapeutic project. How do we chart emancipation? How do we chart a way out that we break chains of oppression and we restore human freedom, to use Marxist term? 
So it's not just political freedom, it's human freedom. So you, the ability to flourish, the ability to self-realize, the ability to actualize. And critical race theory operates as a subset of critical theory insofar as that the critical race perspective says, everything you traditionally think about race is wrong. Firstly, you think of, we naturally think about race in biological terms, wrong. We even think about race in terms of metaphysical categories that you have to have necessary and sufficient conditions in order to be deemed of a certain race. That's also wrong. And then above all, above all, at the level of social and political theory, you start thinking about race in terms of, well, do you, or rather are those institutions of modernity, like the public sphere, like the democratic state, are those institutions themselves which promise dignity, fairness, equality, justice, are those institutions themselves built on lies? You know, take the American constitution, we the people, or God created man equal. Who is the author of that? And why, if that's to be, if we take that literally, that we say, okay, so every human being is deemed free and equal. Why is it that for centuries, a whole subset of human beings, people of color, were not just simply deprived of rights, but enslaved? So critical race theorists then say, America is a perfect example of critical race theoretic concerns. You look at the institutions, you look at the structures, you look at the experiences of other people of color, and you start to wonder whether or not the, the country, it's normative promise. You always hear this idea that the promise of America, promise for whom? Promise for whom? And the critical race theorist concern is precisely wanting to say that also when we understand racism, this is another debunking exercise, another myth that has to be overcome. We're not talking about racism in terms of interpersonal individual cases of prejudice and nastiness that we understand racism as a structural phenomenon. To use Honneth's term, it's a social pathology. It's a, it's a problem rooted in the institutional fabric of society itself. And it's manifested in the way, for example, the, for, the branches of government, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary are designed to not simply produce forms of racial oppression by denying certain people rights, but to reproduce it in modernity, to find new, more insidious ways of producing racial oppression. Take, say, for example, with Windrush as a classic example of producing racial oppression, or even the Grenfell Tower disaster is a form of racial oppression insofar as that you, you look at even how housing itself is structured alongside oppressive norms. Certain people with certain racial privileges will have better quality of housing, others won't. Mm -hmm. And that's also connected as well with socioeconomic issues about class, about sexuality, about gender, about disability. So the critical race perspective, just, just like feminism is, a, is another version of um, critical theory insofar as it's concerned with women's liberation, you know, that basically says it all liberation, that's the concern mm. of the critical race theorists. You also have it also with queer theory, gay liberation. Queer theorists are critical theorists in that broad sense, insofar as that they think that our whole vocabulary of thinking about sexuality is wrong. You know, queer psychology is not interested in accommodating queerness. You know, queer does not want to be accommodated, queer demands that the whole configuration, the whole constellation of concepts is radically changed. So it's not about having a seat at the table. It's about reorganizing the table so that everyone gets a, a seat at it. Not that you are being allowed in or accommodated or made room for. And do you see the, the education of, of critical theory? Do you see this as a tool in changing institutional uh, normative status quo? and how i i think it is a moral imperative that even at primary school 
even at kindergarten somehow, if we can get if we can get this, that th that critical theory becomes taught. It has to be has to be on the syllabus, whether in in and even applied to the whole educational principle. So the whole idea of about decolonizing the curriculum. So some mm -hmm. listeners might not be familiar with this, but decolonizing the curriculum is the critical theoretic approach to education. Mm -hmm. It is critical pedagogy, in other words. And the idea is that the reason why the Conservative Party are reluctant to the extent they are even almost on the verge of criminalizing, which I find very bizarre in a free country, um, discourse about critical race theory, you know, to criminalize the idea of saying that the UK is systemically racist, and this is what systemic racism means, is because they know that when people are confronted by critical theory frameworks, ideas, they become very difficult to control. It becomes a citizenry that yearns for change. And the, that's in and of itself a reason to want the system to be shaken up because critical mm -hmm. theory produces democratically minded, emotionally receptive, sensitive people empathetic people who are committed to social justice and to progressive change. And that is a threat to conservatives. I mean, I always find it funny because when, whenever, I, whenever I've given talks on feminist epistemology, and I always talk about how everything that I know in feminism is very much indebted, completely indebted even, to iconic black feminist epistemologists like Angela Davis and Audre Lorde. You know, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything new to be perfectly clear. You know, I'm, I'm very much indebted to their frameworks. So I just, I found myself being able to conceptualize things in a certain way only because of the resources that I've learned from them. Whenever I've been giving these papers, people, particularly men just say things like oh god you know i get really angry when i'm confronted by angry women and i'm just thinking what do you mean angry women it's a very interesting expression angry women it's also racialized and i just start thinking it reveals exactly this point this is why we have to have the critical theory approach embedded it at all levels of the curriculum is because the politics of anger and resentment that drives populist movements like Trumpism, like Brexit, is the result of a failed education system in part. And if we, if we are unable to explain to people that the circumstances which are resulting in their feelings of resentment, their feelings of marginalization, are to do with the feelings of the status quo, the failings of the current economic system, that will end the kind of bitter social fragmentation that you have with people on the left. And I think that's, that's also what critical theory ultimately is about. It's not just simply relationships or solidarity, it's about building community and about ending the infighting with people on the left and also ending the conflict between the haves and haves nots because we all we all point the target to the idea that the issue comes back to a failed economic system mm. a failed political system which is not fit for purpose and that means the politics of division completely disappears eventually mm. So that's why there is so much at stake. There's, there's in the individual benefits, you know, you knowing what's what, you're not bullshitted by the system. Apologies mm -hmm. for, the, for the swearing, if no that's acceptable. Um, and you become socially conscientious. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting um, in, 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 the, in your chapter that you talked about the sort of the poverty causing alienation uh, from society and its institutions, I thought that was really, and the quote from Rab C. Nesbitt yeah. uh, of, you know, we are shite and that kind of, you know, the difference mm -hmm. between, you know, being able to, this thing about social mobilization, but there is such a sort of, there is a, a level of poverty where social mobilization will never happen. And this whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps yeah. kind of terminology um, 
is damaging and it blames the victim and yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, because Marx was, was said to be a disciple of Hegel. Mm, yes. Um, and he said that if you change the economic situation, you will change human nature and we will overcome the divisions of what you were just saying. Um, how much would you agree with that? In part, okay. because my only worry about th that, um, you know, economism that Marx is usually deemed guilty of is that it suggests that those categories, the economic categories and the ideological narratives underpinning social and political systems are seen as non-intersectionally weaving. For me, the issue is the, the economy is not separate from other forms of life. And the idea is that we shouldn't think about human nature as separate from the, the economy. And this goes back to the Hegelian point, is that it's an emergent relation. Yeah. So I think what will happen is there has to be a kind of virtuous circle of development. You know, if you improve the, the, economic, the economic forms of production, you are able to, to reform radically. We're not tweaking it in exactly in the way that social mobility is just a tweak. Oh, you know, just give them access to here and then they'll be fine. If you're able to transform economic provision, you are able to, in part, nullify the economic conditions which give rise to the what Hegel calls the rabble. And Aristotle has this very famous insight, poverty is the breeding ground of revolution. But also, and this is why it's a virtuous circle, when people are in better positions of human nature, they are more empathetic, more caring, more considerate, more community oriented, mm. that preside, precisely necessitates the overcoming of an, an economic system, which is all about, as you very eloquently said, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mm. fend for yourself, you know, that contempt for vulnerability, mm -hmm. which I think is, is chronic in the States and the, and the UK, the, the idea that the dependent the vulnerability is something to be despised, something to be vilified, something to be um, an object of derision. Mm -hmm. And it manifests itself and also in, in gender terms, you know, for example, like boys don't cry because you know, that's mm -hmm. girly, um, or you throw like a girl, you're weak. So, you know, there's all of these connotations and it's, and it's very much as well a, a symptom of that kind of fully pathological and diseased economic system that we operate in, where capitalism is precisely about alienation. Mm -hmm. Not simply in the sense that Marx talked about, you know, the, those, those principal forms, alienation from the products, alienation yeah. from your speech sessions and the like, but more about the fact that you, you no longer are able to function as an, in the right kind of emotional ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, and I think that's something which is has to be desperately fixed. So that's why the Marxian point is is only half the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Aaron, did you want to say something? Then? I was about to say that um, when it's about free speech, um, how all these liberals like talk about free speech, like they say it's um, like the key principle to their society, purely mm. due to this changing of human nature to a more compassionate, like ethical, like critical, you know, yeah. fashion like due to free speech, surely that shows that free speech and capitalism contradict really. It's a very, very good point because I think part of what the whole free speech issue revolves on is a complete misunderstanding of what free speech actually involves. Mm. So most, most people, particularly on, on the right, think that what, what free speech means is you get to say what you want without, without um, being called out. No, it's free speech. I can say what I like. What, when you actually peel the layers of free speech, it has a very, very particular notion of responsibility attached to it. Mm -hmm. That what free speech is defined as is not the capacity to say what you like without, without being coerced, but it's the idea that you own a position and that you are responsible for articulating those commitments attached to the position. And that's, that's ultimately a, an issue which reveals the failings of liberalism. Because liberalism is principally defined as not only giving the individual sacrosanct position in relation to the community, 
but in the sense that you define yourself purely in a negative relation. Freedom from interference. That is the principal liberal trope. And that, and that mutates into libertarianism. You know, we might find Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation funny, but you know, Ron Swanson has that kind of full-blown pathological libertarian streak, which is, you know, you can't even, I won't even listen to you because the, uh, the presence of other people, the presence of institutions is an act of repression. And I think that's part of the problem is that if we keep on thinking of free speech in the sense of, you know, I can just say what I like and people just have to deal with it. When we, when we examine when people are called out, there's, there's a concern that, you know, they want to avoid responsibility. You know, by all means, say what you like, but you have to be prepared to defend that and be answerable to people. You have to own that position. That's and, what being autonomous is. Yeah. And so what's your opinion on private corporations, social media corporations having the, the power to police the free speech of uh, of people in society at the moment it's it's very some people yeah i i suspect for example now you know it's very good in the way that we're having this this podcast in the wake of what's happening with the u.s elections so you know trump just saying there's fraud and then him saying like, oh no, no but it's free speech i can say what i like mm -hmm. but you know what's happened is that you you are as a, as a responsible social media company, and it's so difficult because the, the blurring of the distinction between flagging and controlling is so razor thin, is I think what you have to have, and this is a, this is a point about how one can, if you have a kind of critical theory approach to technology, is that the, the logic behind the social media institutional structure cannot be involved about steering people along particular views. What you can only do is ensure that you stamp out mass forms of deception. You can't, for example, you know, unless, for example, people are able, and on social media, unless people are radically engaging in pure hate speech and, and deliberate forms of disinformation and misinformation, you, you can't possibly regulate that discussion. That just becomes a form of regulatory power. It produces a type of disciplining of discourse, which is very dangerous. And, and I think that's, that's, that's the line that has to be kept in play. You know, you have to regulate without disciplining. But of course, when you have to discipline, you have to discipline not because you want, you know, everyone singing from the same, same hymn sheet, but you discipline for the sake of preserving basic norms which are responsible for viable communication in the first place. So don't tell lies, don't dehumanize people. If you disagree with people, that's fine. Mm. I, disagree with, I disagree with tons of people about, about economic structures, but you know, I would never go down the route and they wouldn't go down the route of racial vilification, dehumanization, mm inciting violence, inciting harm, you know, and I think that's what's been happened, that's what's happened is that the, when social media has got out of control is its inability to recognize that it has a duty of care and that there is no justification for, for silencing people unless those people who are being silenced are precisely trying to incite violence mm -hmm. and, and without evidence debase institutions. So, for example, Steve Bannon being removed from YouTube is exactly, that's how good social media works. But, you know, simply, you know, having a, having a blackout of someone because they say, oh, actually, I'm not so sure about whether or not capitalism works. But no, you can't do that. But it doesn't it get very dangerous when it's like, who decides, you know, because that is the private corporation. Um, you know, they happen to be sort of more left liberal leaning. Yeah. But it is at the end of the day a private corporation and this lack of transparency and the fact that it's a profit making company making a decision of who gets blacked out or who doesn't, you know, that I, I think that's very, very problematic. I think um, the, key, the key thing there is precisely what you have identified, it's the, the, the for profit narrative. Mm -hmm. 
for profit narrative automatically suggests that there is a specific kind of line that's being towed. Mm -hmm. And I think if we remove the, the for profit line from the social media infrastructure, it will produce a different kind of social media experience as well. Well, at least that's the good thing about maybe COVID and the pandemic, everything going online, that maybe Wi-Fi and internet will become like a, a, a human right, like food and shelter and, and warmth and stuff. Maybe maybe yeah. internet connection is the next one. Um, boys, did you, lads, did you have any questions? I'm curious though, like um, about social media, surely like even if we do have like, you know, like maybe um, this comes from a privileged a privilege mm. position. Um, even if we do have this, like, you know, people like Steve Bannon, people like these white nationalists, and surely it's still okay to keep them on social media, just simply not even, like, to say, like, oh, I like what they're saying, but surely it's, that's, like, somewhat, it's somewhat fun to investigate. So it's, I mean, if you, if you push it down, it ends up sort of getting, like, a cult following, doesn't it, if you try to sort of suppress or, or hide something, yeah. There is a worry always about the idea that if you if you completely silence those voices, you end up making them martyrs. Exactly. <laughs> and I suppose one thing is that in relation to what you've just said, Aaron and Laura, John Stuart Mill has this very famous one of his famous arguments in defence of um, you know total free press is the idea that actually, if you suppress those voices, you won't have the opportunity to find the best ways of critiquing them. Exactly. Which is an interesting idea. I mean, you, you kind of think, okay, here, here's, here's a way of critiquing, you know, you receive the Steve Bannon tweet, you know, you see how moronic it is on every level, but what's the best way of critiquing it? Is it a conservative critique? Is it a liberal critique? Is it an anarcho-syndicalist critique? Is it a post-colonial critique? So there are exercises in which that kind of that kind of occupant in the space of reasons, a completely stupid, dangerous view, forces us to also, above all, be perennially on our guard. Because part of the problem which led, I think, to Trump's election in 2016 mm. was precisely this narrative that the left had was, oh yeah, you know, we live in a post-racial world. Obama was elected president. Black man was president. Liberalism dropped the mic. Done. Next. And I think that's the problem, is that people on the left tend to underestimate how insidious and cunning the right are. But when you say the right, who do you exactly mean? Do you mean the people in power or do you mean the people who happen to vote conservative? Not necessarily people who vote conservative as such. I think it's that there are, there are always re reactionary forces in place. So for example, with the U in the UK, you know, the, the petition to develop an alternative voting scheme fell flat on its face, even though you hear all the time people talking about the problem with first past the post. Yeah, the that, that happened when I wasn't in, in this country. Someone said we had a vote to change that. And I'm like, yeah. excuse me, how did I miss that? And it didn't pass. There was a referendum which was trounced. First past the post won by a huge proportion, mm -hmm. like landslide victory, like at least 10 percentage points, if I'm not mistaken. But do fact check me about the- mm -hmm. Wasn't it no turnout as well? Yeah. Like, wasn't it super low? Like less than 40% less than actually turned out to vote. It? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you have this situation and then you have, you know, with Brexit, 52 percent. And we can even bracket the issues about all of the lies and deceit in that. But there is something rotten about those democratic institutions. And in a way, the problem is, it's that certain voices of critique are either misrepresented. So the classic trope is to say, if you're critical of the UK, it means you are not patriotic. Mm. It's a very effective line for, for quelling critique. You, know, you immediately get all of those, the, the far right people especially get activated because they say, look, we're defending the country. You know, and that's very typical in, in Trump as well. So 
the issues facing the, the voting practices at every level of the institutional structure and design have to be addressed. And this is another thing that critical theorists of all persuasions, whether again, Frankfurt School, queer theory, radical feminists, they're all highlighting about these limitations on freedom by the institutional arrangements. And as long as we keep on drawing attention to this, I'm not saying we'll win, I'm not saying progressive forces will win, hopefully, obviously, ideally they will win, but at least it ensures that you speak truth to power. And that's something at least. Might not be materially anything, but it's symbolically hugely powerful to do that. The ability to, to be critical. And you know, there's that wonderful poem by Rudyard Kipling, you know, if you can if you can keep your head while all about you are losing theirs. Well, exactly. Now, I suppose that's one of the most difficult things about the, the, the critical theory project is that you'll always feel at some point like you're the only person who is who is observing like, am I the only one who actually thinks that there's a problem here? Like, can you not see that there's an issue? And there are people who, who share that conviction. You're not alone. And that's very important to remember. You are not alone in sharing that conviction. But you know, if you're vegan, I'm not vegan myself, but I know very close friends of mine are vegan and for them it's it's agonizing to you know think like am i the only one who just sees that there's a problem with mm. the dairy industry with the meat industry with the economic but system i think that as well like it's sometimes mm. it's hard you know when people you said about the, the huge divide of people on the left and the right screaming at each other and yeah. they think oh because you because you think that you must be a, a, a nasty evil person that's the only time that i kind of think with vegetarianism and veganism that you, we know now, we know now what the meat industry does and the dairy industry does. And it is hard for me when somebody who does know that still doesn't choose to be a vegan. I have to think, well, that that's, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It's just that that's their choices. But I can see how someone would go down the route of thinking that that person, because they don't agree with, with the so-called moral or the right way to do things, might not be a good person. It's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. It, um, is. Of someone. it is very much. I was about to say, like... Um... You know, stuff like, um, for example, like, I felt that recently because, you know, gypsies, like, people, I don't know if I should use that term or not, but mm -hmm. people not, like, upholding, like, talking about, like, you know, liberation of um, Romani people. Like, I've literally seen, I have, like, an example, a story of, like, you know, when I felt I was the only kind of room, or, like, even, you know, in my collective, like, social media world talking about, mm -hmm. you know, liberation of the Romani people like I put up something on my story that I was saying hey why that why is no one talking about this issue but but then I got like a bunch of messages saying that this is something we really need to yeah yeah so um how do you want like because <clears throat> I was just think, saying that um tons of people mm. you know like actually came out and said hey I've seen this problem too but I haven't you know for about like you know posting on social media about it because that's not what the collective consciousness is saying but um i think one of the issues and this is where it's it's almost kind of poetic that we we began with the question about hegel and now we're ending with the question about hegel it's it, it boils down to an issue of recognition and specifically this is not so much a moral issue it's more of a particular kind of epistemic issue. It's an issue in action how we even make sense of propositions in the first place, how we even make sense of the, the judgment itself. Romana people are people. Yeah. You know, think about also with um, contemporary, contemporary issues about anti Semitism, Jews are people, you know, <laughs> Black Lives Matter. How, how, how Black Lives Matter can be so easily mutated into a kind of vicious supremacist line of thinking, yeah. which gives rise to the counter reactionary discourse of all lives matter. Mm -hmm. I think th that's the new front of the discourse. Yeah. It's examining the, the epistemology of recognition and mm -hmm. working out why is it that we 
are we are reluctant to engage in that kind of discourse so referencing it back again laura's example about the vegan point you know that everything about the meat industry the dairy industry is cruel degrading violent barbaric alienating so why do you still eat meat it can't just be an issue that you get from plato and Aristotle, acrasia, the weakness of will, you know, you know it's wrong, but you still do it. It's not an issue, as many liberal thinkers think, it's just implicit bias. Implicit bias is not a, a, a zero sum game that you can just use to solve every problem. Oh, it's implicit bias. It's a very shallow trope, that type of thinking. The root of the structure lies in how, because our agency, our, our rational sense making is so situated in institutional designs that it takes a huge amount, a monumental amount of psychological effort to try and extricate your subjectivity from the institutional settings. Yeah. And that is something which it's not an issue even about, you know, strength of will. Again, it's not just, you know, pull yourself up by your psychological bootstraps here. Mm -hmm. It's a point about how, and now this is how Hegel starts to kind of bleed into Foucault, we start examining how disciplines, forms of disciplinary power are present at every single social level. At the most elaborate form of parliamentary disciplinarity, you, know, you observe and internalise what goes on in the, in the parliamentary discourse, to how it filters down even to the family how you inherit habits mm -hmm. and that's one of the hardest things to do one of the hardest things to do so critical theorists talk a lot about holding speak outs consciousness raising initiatives that's something which you always hear in activist circles and that's the hardest point the hardest point is to get people to understand that these institutions don't promise freedom that they are built on relations of oppression and it's very difficult for people, particularly in the Western in Western society, especially to go back way to go back to Aram's earlier point. Especially people in privilege cannot accept the idea that they are privileged, because for whatever reason they'll think that that leads to the the loss of their sense of achievement. It will create forms of guilt. Or also they kind of, I mean, I think sort of see, some people see privilege and go, well, I don't have a privileged life. They see privilege as, you know, somebody who's rich or, or famous or somebody who has all of everything they've ever wanted or so it seems. So I think people equate, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging word for some people. Privilege yeah. is, it's a challenging word to, uh, yeah. I think that's, that's why more attention to that epistemology of recognition that goes on and saying, well, what, what, when, we, when we even use the expression and we say X is privileged, what are, we, what are we doing when we use these kinds of words? What is the performative force of these words? Is it to, you know, make you know, Brad Pitt aware that actually he has all of these advantages? For example, someone who is white and working class to be deemed privileged what does it mean in that particular context because it's mm -hmm. obviously not the same as saying brad pitt is privileged mm -hmm. you know, to make that claim would be complete misapplication of the category so understanding these intersecting and weaving forms of of discourse is central to to uh, to good theoretical work which then serves as the as the backdrop for good activist work Okay. I was Great. going to say though, um, oh, sorry. one very interesting, wait, one very interesting thing about you know critical theory is like the anal the analysis of like media about how media can be used to tell a political uh, like a political narrative. Yeah. And one example is um, I think it's very good. Is like I don't know if you watch anime at all, but have you heard of Gurren Lagann? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? It's like we have some metaphor anime and then like, how you can see that for example as a metaphor for revolution and stuff overcoming you know like the norms of the time like overcome mm -hmm. like looking outside the box going outside the boundaries like they literally go outside of the universal boundaries don't they 
it's yeah. really, that's a really great point, Aaron, because what you've just said reminds me, and I think it would be great for, for your listeners to explore this in their own time, not when bot teaching is raging, but certainly, mm. uh, you know, something about an independent project, possibly, for those of you in, on the BA philosophy programs. But this wonderful debate between Vata Benjamin and Adorno okay. on whether or not art is capable of being a source of revolutionary praxis. Because Benjamin thought, you know, film, particularly film, is his focus in his landmark essay on the technical, re the, the work of art and, the and its technical reproducibility, is precisely this issue about how you can use visual and aesthetic media to enable people to grasp revolutionary moments. Oh, now I understand actually, yes, this is why we are oppressed for these reasons. This is why mm. people are marginalized. But then the counter narrative is that particularly if you, if you are someone like Rupert Murdoch and you exert a huge amount of control over the media narrative, is that you can, you can easily see the media as being a source of entrenching domination yeah. as opposed to a vehicle of emancipation. And that's, I suppose, one of the most incredible features of the media is that the media can be a source of freedom and a source of domination at the same time. And effectively, who controls the media is going to determine which impulse is, is hegemonic at that moment in time. And that's why I think is really fascinating. Because, you know, I don't want to go down Adorno's route and be really pessimistic to say that, you know, now with the culture industry, we're all just, you know, watching like sheep, Michael Bay's Transformers films and just clapping mindlessly at the loud noises of Optimus Prime fighting Megatron and whatever. And, you know, like, where's the Kurosawa? Where's the Seven Samurai type film being made? Well, you know, Parasite. If you haven't seen Parasite, that is a monumental work of critical theory right there. Brutal, brutal critique of um, South Korea's particular variety of capitalism and, and its conception as well of the urban environment itself. So films are still capable mm -hmm. of, of encouraging art as well is still all about that revolutionary praxis. So keep producing films keep producing what, art. Yeah. what i'd have to say on that as well is that um let's say if you if more people try to analyze stuff like why i mentioned because so if i'm just like nerding out about this because it's one of my favorite like you know pure sport time but what i do honestly think is that let's say we have um a lot of people who watch anime are very right wing like mm -hmm. there's a very right wing like tendency within that culture so i feel if we kind of like analyze these Kills and stuff from the like a correct like left wing perspective, then we can really will convert a hell of a lot of people to you know actually looking at their society in a lot more of a critical fashion. I mean, I would I'm all up for the idea of you know literary theorists, of which Benjamin was a great literary theorist, and and media specialists working alongside. Um, you know, sociologists, psychoanalysts and philosophers on these issues because, you know, as again, to go back to that Hegelian point, since life is immensely complex to and through, the problems of modernity cannot be solved by one particular disciplinary perspective. Mm -hmm. You need to have as much collaboration as possible because mm -hmm. a complex a complex problem problem seems to necessitate a complex solution and I think mm -hmm. that's 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 what should happen so what you've just said is including that in the narrative in media studies so not just simply looking at Facebook mm -hmm. not just simply looking at Snapchat but looking at every variety of media that that can be used you know a critical take on the Big Bang theory for example is something which mm -hmm. is one of the best videos I've ever seen on YouTube is the you know the calling out of the misogyny on the Big Bang Theory show. I thought it was a monumental piece of, of work, you know, could stand up, you know, Adorno would be proud yeah. 
Yeah, on YouTube, you just look at you know a dorkable misogyny, and it's it's just brilliant. It's an absolutely fantastic piece. Because I, I always remember thinking like, why do I hate the Big Bang Theory so much? Oh yeah, that's why. Um, so that's the point. So the, these kinds of ideas, and this is very important. You know, I want I want all the listeners to to remember this. Critical theory is not doesn't belong to a particular discipline. It belongs to everyone. Yeah. It's very important. It's a very important point to remember. It does not belong to philosophers, does not belong to psychoanalysts, does not belong to literary theorists, but belongs to everyone. And owning it is going against the very function of critical theory itself. It is the ultimate irony in many respects of the left is that the left has this remarkable ability to always turn on itself. Yeah. It's an extraordinary ability. Who's purer than who? Who's the most critical, critical theorist? I mean, I, I, I you know, rant about that in the chapter, as, as you know, but it is very important to bear in mind. This is a serious issue that if you, if you do want to develop any kind, if people do want to develop a really kind of impactful progressive movement, the politics and hierarchy of who's purer than who, the gatekeeping, can, cannot have any place in that in that framework. Absolutely you know, agree. Absolutely agree. Before Daenerys Targaryen went mad when she said, you know, Stark, Targaryen, I actually embarrassingly have gone black. Lannister, that's another name. <laughs> Lannister. You know, they're all spokes on the wheel. Mm -hmm. One's on top, one's on the bottom. One's on top, one's on the bottom. But the aim is to not be in the position of domination in the wheel. It's to break the wheel yeah so that's the most important point really that the heart of critical theory is a serious commitment to ending all forms of hierarchy great family In group state everything yeah is there um did you want to sort of push any kind of social media outlets ironically um if you want uh, students want to follow you or oh. Well, I mean, students want to follow me. That's great. I mean, I even I even find the expression "following" strange because it's not like you know like a stalking tendency. <laughs> okay, <laughs> exactly. No, it's, it's, you know, I, I I tweet about Simpsons and about politics, so no, it's all good. Yeah, um, but yeah, if there if there is one particular there's one particular group that or you know blog post which is really fascinating. It is it is run by a friend of mine. Um, who was Raymond Goyce's, one of the brilliant critical theorists, Raymond Goyce's last PhD student. Um, it's called Red Platius, and is, it is a wonderful, wonderful podcast on Marxism and anarchism and critical theory in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, a, they're just really fantastic because it's, they go through textual detail, real warmth, humour and scholarly richness. And they're not peddling binaries like anyone who doesn't agree with is evil. Mm -hmm. They just simply want to educate people. Okay. And it's, it's, it's just beautiful. You know, it's education at its best. If you have access to the internet and you have access to Twitter and you just type in Red Platius, it's there. And they're really nice. So big shout out to my my dear friend Paul. Um, you know, keep keep doing great work, Paul. We're all we're all indebted to you. So students, friends, foes as well. If you don't if you don't if you disagree with anything that has been said in the podcast, tune in to 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 learn and and engage with these people because who knows. You might yeah. learn so you might learn something exactly exactly so i think that's a good place to to end guys do you have any more questions for paul no no so thank you very very much paul for being with us for um we've taken up quite a lot of your time so your book is called um hegel and the frankfurt school yeah and it's out in december yeah go the christmas present just yeah. before christmas eve so if you're panicking last minute shopping panicking get that gift Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Good.